so thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Andy Lee. I am a communications advocate with Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Uh, this is our first workshop of our student media elections workshop, hoping to create uh, a place where student journalists and young organizers can learn some of the basics of uh, the election as uh, a very complicated and um, ever-shifting electoral landscape approaches uh, this fall. Um, I uh, uh, will be here kind of managing stuff from the background, but uh, for today, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over, and over to Adrienne Spoto to make some introductions. Hi all, so thrilled to have you here. So my name is Adrienne Spoto. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a voting rights fellow at SCSJ. And I'm going to try to share my screen. And oh, actually, screen sharing is disabled, Andy. We'll figure that out. Um, but in the meantime, um, I will turn it over to Rachel first for introductions and then Caitlin. Hi, I'm Rachel Raper. I'm the Director of Elections for Orange County. I've been in Orange County since 2018, and then I've been in full-time in elections since 2005, so going on 19 years. Amazing. Hey, everyone. I'm Caitlin Metzger. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of You Can Vote, and so we're based in Durham, but work um, statewide to make sure that voters have the information they need to make their voting plan and to get registered uh, every time they move or when they're new to the area. And I use your pronouns as well. And are folks able to see the slideshow now? Okay, perfect. So for today's session, um, this is Elections 101. And so we're hoping to give y'all an overview of how elections work in North Carolina, um, who's responsible for running them, how voting works, the different processes involved in that and the requirements, um, how the counting process works and things like that. I'm hoping to give you the background information that will be helpful in covering elections. Uh, for some of y'all, this might be the first time you're hearing any of these things. Uh, for others, you might already be fairly familiar with it and hopefully this will be a good refresher session and future sessions will cover other topics of interest um, in some more detail, like covering legal issues in elections, um, issues related to students, things like that. So the first question is, um, who's responsible for running elections in North Carolina? And so here that's done by the State Board of Elections and the 100 County Boards of Elections. So the State Board of Elections includes five board members. Uh, the current ones are Alan Hirsch, Jeff Carmen, Stacey Eggers, Kevin Lewis, and Siobhan O'Duffy Millen. Um, there's also an executive director whose name is Karen Brinson Bell, and also a number of different staff members. The board members are appointed by the governor who relies on a list of nominees from both the Republican and Democratic parties. You might have heard about a law being passed, SB 749, that would change how the state board and the county boards of elections are made up. Um, that change was enjoined by a state court and there's an appeal pending right now, but nothing like given the time frame, that's not expected to be resolved until after this election. So that's not something, not something that you need to worry about for the time being. So what does the state board do? The state board is in charge of overseeing all 100 county boards of elections and trying to make sure that elections administration is done in a uniform, consistent manner that's compliant with the law. They'll issue rules, um, other binding guidance, such as numbered memos, um, all sorts of things to help make sure that, that elections are running the way that they're supposed to. And they also provide a good amount of public education, data, and other analysis um, that can be really helpful both as a citizen and also as a reporter. They hold meetings um, intermittently that are open to the public, generally online, 
Um, we have the meeting link in the slides, which I believe we'll be able to distribute those slides to y'all as well. So you'll be able to check on that link. You can also sign up for email updates from the state board, and that's a really good idea if you're going to be covering elections. You'll get those meeting notices, but you'll also get any press releases issued by the state board, um, media briefing opportunities. Generally, they'll offer those, say, at the start of early voting um, or on election day um, as another opportunity to, to ask questions and get answers from the board. So if you sign up for those emails um, at the bottom of their website, you'll get all that information. Then a lot of the the day to day action um, and what we think of when we think of running an election is handled by the county boards of elections. Those also have five board members. Um, they'll have a county director, one of whom we're joined by today. And also staff, um, staffing will, uh, county boards will really depend on the size of the county, um, the county's resources, the county's funding, things like that. Um, so some counties might have a lot of staff and some might just have a couple. So um, for the board members, uh, they're appointed by the State Board of Elections, um, also working off of a list of nominees from both the Republican and Democratic parties. And then the board's chair is appointed by the governor. So like I said, the, the county boards of elections are responsible for that day-to-day -day administrative work, a ton of different tasks. Um, we have just a couple of them, some of them listed here, um, but there's much more. And their meetings are also going to be open to the public. Uh, the state board has a really helpful lookup tool that you can use to find the particular county board's website, their contact information, um, to learn about when their meetings are happening. Some of them happen online. Some of them are only in person. And so you'd have to be able to get there if you want to, to be there to hear what they're deciding. Um, some of them will post minutes, agendas. It really varies on a county by county basis. And since we are joined by a county elections director, Rachel, um, love to hear anything that you have to share about, about your experiences, the work you do, things that you think would be helpful for folks to know. Yes, um, you know, as you touched on, the state board does ensure the uniformity of elections because what we really want is the voter experience to be the same no matter what county they're in. So I think that that's one of my favorite things about working for North Carolina elections is that, you know, we do answer to, um, you know, one entity as opposed to different elected officials as other states do. So the state board absolutely ensures uniformity. Um, one thing I do like to point out that in North Carolina, we use a uniform um, information management tool. So the state board maintains that information so that you can use the voter search tool. Anyone in North Carolina can use that voter search tool. It's not county dependent. Um, so that's another thing I really like and I really like to tell people about all across North Carolina is to use that voter search tool because it just has such a wealth of information. Um, so I always want to push that whenever I'm able. And then just getting to what we do here at the County Boards of Elections, like you touched on, we have a ton of different tasks. It often feels like we're in a tornado around election time, especially when we're involved or there's a lot of pending litigation swirling around us. So I think the most important thing for county boards is that we are just, we are responsive and we try to be proactive. So if you ever have any issues or you see something that you have a question about, certainly reach out to your county board, um, the director or staff there. So you can, as soon as you see something, you can talk about why, why something might be happening or you can alert um, staff that, hey, there's a problem. I know that a lot of times journalists are right on the front lines. They're talking to voters. So you might pick up on something that we just don't know about at the office. So we really appreciate just your work as journalists letting us know that the, an issue might be brewing. All right. Thank you for that. And one final note. Um, in addition to elections being run largely by the county boards of elections, elections are also mainly funded at the county level. That funding comes from the Board of County Commissioners. Um, 
And of course, as you can imagine, that sort of funding is critical to, to the work that the board is doing, how many people the board can reach out to, like how, what they're able to offer. Um, our research has found that elections funding is tied to turnout. Um, there's a correlation between the amount that a county spends per voter and the voter, at least we analyzed the 2022 elections and 2022 turnout was corresponding with that. So something to be thinking of, like as you're reporting on things, particularly if it's about like things that the county board is doing, things that the county board could do, but perhaps isn't, one thing to be aware of is, is funding. And now I am going to turn it over to Caitlin um, who has a very helpful resource and tool to show you all. So I will stop screen sharing. I think I'll stop screen sharing. Yes, there, you can do you it. Okay. it now. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull it up now. All right, hey everyone again. Um, I'm Caitlin Metzger from You Can Vote. And I wanted to just use this time to make sure that everyone knows about our resources and our voter guide page. Um, hopefully what you see here, my screen is our voter guide at youcanvote.org slash vote. What this includes is several different links here at the top that we find are the most commonly asked questions or the most commonly needed resources. Um, now is the great time to confirm your voter registration as we are coming up on the deadline in October. Um, voters can still register during early voting, but we're recommending that students especially make sure they try to get registered by October 11th for the deadline, just to have an easier and quicker process when they go vote, hopefully during early voting. So confirming your registration is one thing that we recommend. That's for all voters in North Carolina, whether you're a brand new person just turning 18, whether you're moving here for college, whether you've changed your address, um, maybe you're um, gaining your citizenship for the first time, and becoming a voter, we recommend that really for everyone to make sure that they're registered and on the voter rolls for this year. Um, one reason is just to make sure that you're on there and that you're gonna have an easier time when you go vote. Um, we also have seen some changes in districts since the last time most people voted. We did have a municipal election in 23, but uh, many people haven't voted under these new maps. And so we understand that looking up your registration to verify that you're registered, but also just as an education piece about which legislative district do I live in, which congressional district do I live in, um, the sample ballot, all of that information is on that lookup tool. So this is that um, tool that Rachel was just talking about that is the State Board of Elections lookup. We also have a great new tool um, that is called Ballot or Build Your Ballot. And so you could see who's running. This is a great tool for um, new voters, especially. Um, we got a lot of feedback in the past couple years that even if you're registered to vote, um, one of the pieces missing for folks to voters, first time voters, especially to feel really confident and prepared to go vote was that they weren't sure how to do the research. And so we've partnered with some um, with a nonpartisan organization and made sure that you could see who's running, but also it is linked directly to those candidates' websites. So you can source that material and make sure that you're actually reading um, what is verified <laughs> as much as we can um, and not leaving it up to as much you know, social media and ads that a lot of folks, that might be the only opportunity that they have to hear from, especially some of the down ballot races. So we wanna make sure that folks know, you know that their sample ballot and their research is available for them to do um, and that's particularly important in 2024 because, of course, it's a presidential year and most people are talking about that, but it is such a long ballot this year in 2024 in North Carolina that some places are going to see up to 25, 26 different races in, in addition to local referendums um, and a constitutional amendment that everybody will see. And so sometimes we hear from students that say, you know, oh, I know who I'm going to vote for. And they mention one or two people, but there's, you know, about two dozen people <laughs> that we want to have access, that we want you and your and the students on the campuses to have access to. Um, and so that's why that resource is a really good one to share around. Um, and then early voting, of course, 
As I mentioned, we always recommend early voting. Uh, it's the best option for the most voters in North Carolina. Um, but it does sometimes overlap or run up on to fall break, depending on which campus you're on. So when you're reporting on early voting and, and telling students on various campuses how to make that voting plan, um, I would just factor that in to make sure that you know where does where does fall break <laughs> land during that week. Um, many students are going to be on fall break that the first couple days. Um, and so just being aware of that. Um, and then get registered. We have a, a page about that. We do have partial online voter registration in North Carolina. So folks who are DMV customers and are in the DMV system um, in North Carolina can do that process online. Um, but we as an organization always use the paper forms. We just find that that can be a guaranteed process because we turn in those forms in person. Um, and the DMV site is, is, um, is great, but it's also a DMV website. And so sometimes there are issues that it doesn't actually port over the same way or the, in, in a timely fashion. So we as an organization, um, we want people to have the options and have the information. So we, you know, we want people to know that they can use that online portal, um, but it's not always the best option. And especially for out-of-state students who might not have a North Carolina driver's license, it's not an option. And then voter ID, uh, we do have a full section on our website there. That's definitely been a hot topic that a lot of folks are talking about. Um, and so that's why it is, I'm gonna scroll here for a second. Um, we have a, a full section about this on our website, but I just wanted you to see that basically everything that I just talked about is expanded upon on this voter guide. So this is the candidate guide information. The voter ID page is here. We have examples of, or the list here of all the acceptable IDs. Um, if someone does not have one, we have the information here about what to do and what to ask for. Um, we also have the voter hotline in case anyone has questions or problems. Um, I'm going to keep scrolling here. There's a, an option here for if you need help getting a photo ID. That's another thing that the Board of Elections has been um, so great on a county level basis to make sure that folks have access to get those free IDs when they need it um, and that registered voters can get that free ID if they choose to. Um, and then we, I'm just going to keep scrolling. So, you know, there's so much information here on this voter guide page. The last thing that I just want to share um, to make sure that you know, I'm going to scroll back up at the top and I can put these in the chat or we can share these around as well. But especially for students, we have a section here for college students and college administrators. Um, and the campus voting guide is specifically about how to register on campus if you live on campus. Um, one of the myths that we talk to a lot of voters about is that they are not aware that they can register to vote, even if they're somewhere from somewhere else, but are here for college. Um, and so we have an outline here, an outline section here about how to register to vote and how to do that process. Um, so that is one thing that could be great to share on all the campuses that you're working on to make sure that in North Carolina, um, voters have the option. It's where they consider home whether they wanna travel back home to their hometown and, and vote in person, whether they wanna try to vote by mail um, or if they wanna update their registration, which generally is the easiest we find for, for college students. So this is just a lot of information. I'm gonna drop it in the chat, but, um, but you can vote us here as a resource. We are a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit group and work statewide to try to make sure that folks have access to the information they need to make sense of a complicated, sometimes complicated uh, voter process um, and voter registration process. Let me stop sharing. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. And I think back to you, Adrian. So thank you. Um, and highly, highly, highly recommend uh, you can vote's resources. Um, we ourselves tend to check on them quite a bit before saying anything. So they're definitely a helpful go to. Um, but before, before we shift a little bit further, um, Rachel, I wanted to invite you, if you have anything that you want to share that you think, um, student journalists should know about, about the voting process, about how you vote, um, otherwise we can move on. So I feel like, uh, most has, has been covered. I've 
just speaking for Orange County, we do expect to see the bulk of our voting during early voting. So if a student journalist wants to speak to voters, um, they can certainly go to that campaigning zone. It is important to know that you cannot interview voters within the voting enclosure. That's um, something that our workers um, can help guide student journalists um, should they present. But, um, but yes, I think if you want to cover elections, the early voting period is where we're just going to see a lot of people voting early, especially students. And, and like what was said, we also really appreciate early voting because if there is a problem, if a student finds that they are not registered, you just have options during the early voting period that you do not have on election day. You can, of course, always vote a provisional ballot on election day if you present the vote and your eligibility cannot be confirmed. Um, but you cannot register to vote and show a proof of residency and then register and vote on election day. So I really want to make uh, make sure that that point is clear because we still often have students present on election day and expect to be able to register to vote and vote. And it's heartbreaking when we say, you know, you had you missed the period. Um, so that that process is not available on election day. So just really pushing um the the fact that you cannot register to vote and vote on election day. Coverage of the early voting process can also be really helpful for like building the basis for having where early voting sites should be um, in different counties. Like some counties will have um, election sites on college campuses. Others might not. And so finding out from students like what their voting experience has been like, um, if they really need a voting location on campus and don't have one, or if they have one and it's working really well um, and people should see that. Media coverage can be, can be really helpful in informing what the county board will do in the future. All right, I'm going to try to pull up PowerPoint again. Let's see, is it showing up? Wonderful. Love when technology works. So this is a little bit more on, on what's on the ballot this November. Um, this is also, as Caitlin showed you, this information is available on You Can Vote's website specific to where you are. You can look up your specific ballot information. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of the broad set of offices that'll be up in November, um, including federal offices, statewide offices, um, including a North Carolina Supreme Court judge seat, um, districted offices in different parts of the state, and also city, town, county elections, and a constitutional amendment for the state constitution. So these are all going to be on there, and they're all things that are important to students in different ways. Obviously, federal and state elections um, can really shape the educational experience, educational policy, and also any number of other issues that students care about. But also students while they're, while they're in college, they're living in that college community. And so policies of that city, that county are also deeply important um, and things that, that college students should be able to know about, learn about, and have a voice on. I did just want to, um, this has already been addressed, but also really making sure that um, student journalists talk about sample ballots and encourage people, um, their readers to access their sample ballot. I know here in Orange County, we have a 19 inch ballot and the back of that ballot is full of bonds because Ch the town of Chapel Hill has five bonds. Orange County has one bond. And there's also the constitutional amendment. So this is just a massive ballot. Um, so definitely encourage, like, like we've already talked about, definitely encourage just getting that sample ballot and familiarizing yourself with that sample ballot so that voting takes a little less time because it, it does take a while to read 19 inches of um, information on the back of a ballot. Yeah, no one wants to see that for the first time in the voting booth. So this slide um, lists out some, some important key dates for the election. Um, very soon, uh, starting Friday for military and overseas voters, and then Tuesday for other voters, absentee ballots will be going out. Um, the county boards of elections have been working very, very, very hard 
to print and then reprint those ballots. Um, Y'all might have seen there was litigation over removing um, RFK Jr. and his We the People Party from the ballot. Um, so that is why this process is happening a little later this year compared to other years in the state. So those will be going out soon. Um, and then what's already been mentioned, the October 11th deadline for registering to vote. Um, but again, if someone misses that deadline, they can go to early voting um, and make use of same day registration with their proof of county residency. That early voting period is gonna run from October 17th to November 2nd. And then of course, election day is on November 5th. Polling places will be open from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. And of course, anyone who's in line by 7.30 um, will be able to vote. Also, this is a change um, from past years. Absentee ballots um, must be received by the County Board of Elections by 7.30 on that election day in order to be counted with a limited exception for, for military and overseas voters. Absentee ballots can be returned by mail, obviously. Um, they can be returned to early voting sites when those sites are open, and they can be returned to the County Board of Elections office, but they can't be returned to election day precincts. So what happens on election day after everyone's voted? Um, that's when the county boards of elections continue to be working very, very, very hard to count up all the votes. So you will be able to check for the results um, on the state board's websites after polls close. It'll take a little while for things to start appearing um, and the web page is gonna be updated regularly throughout the night. So like the results you first see and even the results you see at the end of the night are not the final official results. These are the initial counts. Um, by the end of election night, um, the results should generally include uh, the votes that were cast in person, both during early voting and on election day, minus any provisional ballots, which we'll talk about a little more in a bit. It should also include the absentee ballots that were received before election day. But those election night results, at least for now, will not be including provisional ballots and absentee ballots received election day or later. And I'm going to try to pull up the results page just to show you all a little more of what that looks like. Let's see. Okay. All right, so this web page is linked in the slides. Um, I'm starting us off on just the general data page just because it does have a bunch of other things that might be useful to you as well, um, including registration data, um, candidate lists, information on the voting maps, all sorts of information. Um, the state board's website in general has a whole wealth of information that might be useful to you, depending on what you're reporting on. One of those things is the election results dashboard. So this will be where you'll be able to start pulling up results for different counties um, and see how that's going. You can pull up a particular election date. You can also use this for past elections. So that's what we'll do for now. Um, I'll pull up, we'll pull up Orange County. So pull up Orange County. We can display results. This was from um, the runoff election back in May. So that is why there are many fewer races listed here than will be listed for November. Um, so you can pull up all sorts of information on here. Um, and like I mentioned, again, to reemphasize, because this is a recurring issue, um, these results are on election night, they are only going to be some of the results. And I will turn it over to Rachel for a little bit to talk if there's anything she wants to share about all that goes into that election night count. Yeah, so let's just talk about what election night is going to look like. Um, so polls do close at 730. And the first results that you will likely see will be absentee um, by mail results. And like you indicated, that will be all the um, absentee ballots we received by 5pm the day before. 
So that's what you're going to see likely as soon as 730 hits, you're going to see those results. In the past, you would have probably also seen our early voting in-person results, but a new law um, made it so that we are not allowed to close the polls at our early voting sites until the polls close on election night. So that means it takes a little bit longer to collect those totals, upload, and then so that that information will be reported to the state board. I believe um, you'll you'll likely see the bulk of your early voting results around between 8 and 830. And then you will start seeing just when precincts come in because precincts do not electronically send us election results. They are physically brought to us. And so we have to take those physical results and then we upload them into our election management um, software. So like you said, you're going to see that on a rolling basis. Just, you know, I normally do about my waves come in about eight precincts at a time. That's just coming from different directions, coming to our office. And then we take their supplies. We have to reconcile what they're giving us. We're not just grabbing and running. It's a very methodical process to go through and make sure that they have returned everything that they need to return. Our hope in Orange County is to um, have everything uploaded by 10 p.m. Sometimes that doesn't happen. It just depends. Like you said, if you're in line by 730, you get to vote. And depending on how long that line is, um, really is what, um, how, when a precinct can, cl can close, when the last person has cast their ballot and exited the voting location. So I'm hoping that will be done by 10 p.m. Um, we'll see. But again, if, if journalists are used to seeing the bulk of early voting results um, be issued or reported right at 730, I just want to manage expectations. And you'll probably see that you know, 8 to 8.30 instead of at 7.30. Great. And so after all that's happened, um, first of all, one, one more note, um, just for clarity for anyone who's less familiar with how elections are covered, the folks who are calling elections on election night, that is the media and that is sometimes at least candidates. That won't be the election officials. Um, that process happens much later, which is what we'll talk about next. After election day, um, there's a whole process of, of reviewing um, everything that's come in, of counting those provisional ballots, which I mentioned. So those are um, ballots a voter might cast if there are questions about their qualifications to vote, their eligibility for a particular election, their eligibility for a ballot style, um, or also if they weren't able to present that voter photo ID, um, they'll vote a provisional ballot. And so those take research um, or time on the county board's end and also for voter ID, potentially someone coming back into the county board's office to present an ID. So that takes a bit of time. Um, so we have this period between the election and county canvas, which is when votes are counted, where all that work happens. So then county canvas happens on November 15th at 11 a.m. All the county boards will meet um, and they will certify the official vote count for their county. There's often going to be one, maybe a couple pre-canvas meetings in that period between election day and the canvas day, where the county board might be dealing with dealing with provisional ballots in some more detail or some absentee ballot issues or reviewing folks ID exception forms if they weren't able to present photo ID at the polling place um, and instead filled out filled out a sworn statement on why they weren't able to do that. And of course, the county board will review those and unless they find that statement to be false. Um, they're supposed to approve those and allow the person's vote to count. So all of that work will be happening and that all leads up to the county canvas. And then state canvas is on November 26th, again at 11 a.m. So the state board then has received all these certificates from the counties and they'll review those and they will certify the election as well. If there's going to be any recounts, um, which sheer number of things on the ballot this election, entirely possible, those will be happening in between county canvas and state canvas. Um, and of course, both the state and the county boards are 
conducting after the election various audits and checks just to make sure everything is running like it's supposed to. Um, there's more information on those processes on the State Board's website, and we have the link in there in the slides for y'all. And then just a couple, a couple other dates to be aware of when it comes to presidential election results in particular. Uh, so December 11th is the deadline for the governor to issue a certificate appointing the electoral college voters for North Carolina and for all the other states, their um, executive will do that. Then on December 17th, that's the, the meeting and vote for the electors for each state. And then, of course, January 6th, Congress will count the electoral votes. All right. And I'll again invite Rachel, if there's anything you want to talk about, about the Canvas process um, on the county board's ends, things like that. So in Orange County, our pre-Canvas meeting is done um, Thursday at 5 p.m., the day before Canvas. That's when, if you vote a pr uh, provisional ballot, you would have to bring in any material you had to cure that provisional ballot, like, you know, you presented to the voting location and you didn't have your photo ID because you left it at home. You would have voted that provisional ballot and um, you would have been given your call sheet that makes it clear that you have to return to the County Board of Elections with that photo ID to um, to cure that provisional ballot. Um, so if results are close, you likely will not know who um, who is the prevailing candidate until after all counties have completed their pre canvas meeting. Um, and, you know, I just think back in 2020 and we had a race, a statewide race that was decided um, by 400 votes. And so every Every meeting mattered. Every provisional ballot cast mattered. Um, so again, just want to manage expectations and that if there is a, a close race, we get a ton of absentee ballots returned on election day. We get a lot in the mail. Also, just a lot of people come by and drop off those absentee ballots. We don't know what provisional voting, you know, what that what that's going to look like because photo ID is still a question mark. We have had elections with photo ID, but they've been low turnout elections. So we're just, we're not sure what we can expect with um, provisional voting um, with the, the new photo ID laws in, in just a really high turnout election. So really there is a big question mark about, well, will, will it be clear on election night or shortly thereafter about who is the prevailing candidate, or are we going to have to take it all the way until um, canvas day? Um, and again, it just, it just depends on how close those races are. Um, but we, we use those 10 days between election and canvas to reconcile and research. Our office is usually busier after the election than before, because we do, we physically count every piece of paper. We reconcile every ballot to every authorization to vote form to every vote cast on those machines. So um, it is a, a methodical and lengthy process, but it's so that on 11, at 11 a.m. on that Friday, we can certify an election. All right, and before we turn over to questions, uh, just a couple like things you should be aware of when you're reporting on elections. So of course, as a reporter, you always want everything that you publish to be accurate, but it's especially important in the elections environment. Um, the reporting is fast paced, um, but people are also really counting on that information. Um, when people are getting inaccurate information that might make it harder for them to vote, might prevent them from voting. Um, it might also create distrust or confusion. Um, and so those are all things that are really important to avoid. And so that's why it's especially important to make sure that anything that you're printing is reliable and true. Um, and also to be really careful in scrutinizing the sources you're relying on. Like I've mentioned, the state board has really helpful resources on their page. County Board of Elections might also have some really helpful website resources. It kind of depends. Some counties are very website heavy and website focused. Some are a little less and a little more in-person um, related, person-to-person -person connections. Um, so it's just going to depend a little bit, but it's really important to make sure you're getting good, accurate information from good, accurate sources. And then I'll open it up, um, Rachel, Caitlin, if you have any other 
recommendations that you want to share before we turn over to questions? I just would, um, I guess a question maybe to Rachel, but a, an, a recommendation for everyone. The County Board of Elections is often seeking more poll workers. And so if students want to get involved and be part of that process, um, I don't think it's too late to, to send your name in. There's a great um, website on the State Board of Elections website under the um, Democracy Heroes section. And many of the counties um, generally need a lot more people for an election like this with the higher turnout. Um, and so that's another place where students could get involved or just learn about the process because they're part of the process. Um, and then I would just echo a lot of what Adrian said about verifying your resources or your sources and making sure that that is from 2024. Um, sometimes when we get phone calls or emails at, at our, at my organization, it's because someone found something like, for example, on social media that got reposted from 2020 and a lot of stuff has changed since then. So just making sure that everything is based in 2024 for 24, 2024 elections um, can really help cut through some of that noise because a lot of stuff in our social media or sometimes in our print media as well gets you know republished over and over um, and just you know caution maybe to just double triple check quadruple check um, because those details are critical and especially something like you know, early voting sites, those are not always the same, you know, early voting uh, times, those are not always the same, you know, the rules for absentee voting have changed a lot. So just verifying that and the state board of elections and county boards, um, you know, just making sure that we're telling people what's what's real right now, I think, is one of the biggest things that all of us can do. So I'll just add, um, like Caitlin said, you can certainly um, indicate your interest in working um, on election day at the Democracy Heroes um, portal um, at the State Board of Elections. I'm happy to report that in Orange County, we have a wait list of about 400 people. Um, in 2020, we had a wait list of about 2,000 people. So we are, we are well staffed in Orange County. Uh, but it is a wonderful, the Democracy Hero is a wonderful tool. So students, even if they have parents or just, you know, anyone who is interested in working um, on Election Day, absolutely um, indicate your interest there. It's, it's an excellent tool managed by the State Board of Elections. All right. And we are happy to open up now for questions that anyone has. Um, Andy, I don't know what the best way is for people to share questions. Yeah, feel free. You can either put them into the Q&A function or just in the chat uh, uh, and uh, we'll sort of see who among our panelists uh, are the best to answer. Uh, while I give you guys time to type those out wherever they are, I um, want to say a huge thank you to uh, Caitlin and Rachel for both joining us today for this panel. Um, this is one of three that we are expecting to have. Um, our next panel will feature uh, the senior case coordinator from Democracy Docket, uh, as well as uh, uh, Hillary Klein, uh, senior counsel here at uh, Southern Coalition for Social Justice, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, unearthing the legal documents and rigmarole uh, related to an election and political coverage. Um, and our final uh, workshop will be on uh, issues that are relevant to uh, college students and um, young populations across the state. Um, so uh, uh, be sure to look out for that. Um, a question from Andrew. Uh, for county-specific races, do recounts still occur between the county canvas and state canvas? So, yes, you will see the vast majority of your recounts will be conducted um, the November 20th um, or 21st. There have been new rules that have been um, that we now operate under in terms of when we schedule recounts, when we hear protests. So you'll start um, seeing protests and recounts happen earlier than we possibly have in the in the past. But 
in Orange County, we go ahead and schedule recounts just so I make sure that I have board member availability. And so I believe our recount is scheduled, should we have one, is scheduled for November 20th. But a good idea to reach out to your local county board to see what their, their practices and expectations are. Um, I'll hold to see if there are any other questions, but otherwise this uh, uh, workshop was recorded and will be uh, available as well as the slides that Adrienne uh, uh, created. Um, unless there are any other questions or any other final statements from our panelists. I did just want to um, thank Caitlin and you can vote. Um, it's just such an excellent organization and just um, I'm, I'm glad to know Caitlin and I'm just really, uh, I really appreciate the organization's efforts to help inform voters. And as you know, a, a county board staff who's just often overwhelmed, um, I really appreciate being able to point voters to You Can Vote and um, and their information. So again, I just really want to thank Caitlin for her efforts and her organization's efforts. Get your flowers, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Yeah, this means so much to me. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel, and, and everyone in this space. I think, you know, North Carolina is so lucky that there's so many people trying to educate voters and, and support voters and, and contact voters and um, it's great to be in a coalition of groups that are are voter facing and and voter supporting, especially in a year like this. So appreciate everyone and and thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciate everything you do. Uh, couldn't do it without you. Well, we, we this is a, a wonderful friendship circle, and I think we've uh, uh, celebrated each other. And I think that's uh, uh, enough time to have given everyone enough time to type a question. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Happy election season, go out and vote, um, and uh, we'll see you next time.